Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me, Taryn Urquhart, here in the virtual uh, West Vancouver Memorial Library. Uh, I'm coming to you live from the top of Lonsdale in North Vancouver. But uh, we're going to pretend we're all at the library. All the staff are really missing you. Uh, keep posted um, on our website, our library website, to see when we're opening. We're slowly starting to uh, give patrons holds. So just check our website for the newest information there. Uh, like I said, my name is Taryn. I am the Arts and Special Events Programmer here at the library. I hope there's some out there that I would recognize if we were in person. I am also the resident bug lady at the library and I often teach kids about mason bees and worms and pill bugs, but today they let me talk to adults. So thanks for joining me. I want to start by saying that the home of the library is on the unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, and specifically those of the Squamish Nation, Musqueam Nation, and Tsleil-Waututh Nation. We recognize their presence on this land since time immemorial, and thank everyone for their stewardship of these lands, plants, animals, and today, especially the insects. So we are here to talk about native pollinators, something that is close and dear to my heart. So I'm going to start sharing my screen and we're going to get right into this. So first off, just a little outline of what to expect uh, in our webinar today. Um, a little bit about why I'm so excited about bees. Uh, why bees are always in the news, because if it's not the giant Asian hornet, it's the demise of the honeybees. We'll talk a bit about that. A bit about pollination and our food crops. We're going to delve into social versus solitary bees. Uh, social uh, being mainly the honeybee and bumblebee, and then all the amazing insects that very few of us know about, and most of them are solitary. We'll talk a bit of about, or quite a bit about actually, why bees are so amazing at their pollinating job. And then focus on uh, mason and leafcutter bees, and then alkali and mining bees, two bees that not a lot of people know about. And that included me until about a year ago. And a bit about how we can help the bees moving forward, what plants are best for them, especially in our local um, community and how to create some great habitat for them. So let's delve into the amazing world of native pollinators and get acquainted with some of the insects and bees that are so prevalent in the Pacific Northwest, mostly BC, but a bit down into Washington State. So what is a bee? Most of us, uh, we're taught in school at a very young age that this is the only bee on the planet. This is a lovely picture of a worker, female honeybee. Um, all of us know that she produces glorious honey, but she's also uh, has a stinging end to her. Uh, she can sometimes be a little aggressive if you uh, bother her nest. And there is so much more going on in the bee world. Uh, for example, this bee is not native to North America. It's, this is, happens to be the European honeybee. Um, they came to the New World about 400 years ago with the first settlers. Uh, the indigenous peoples called them white man fly because if they saw them in their communities, they knew the white man was not far behind, so they would often pack up and move on. So this is an amazing little creature, but there are so many other bees on this planet. This one being one of my favorites, this is the Blue Orchard Mason Bee. Notice uh, it's a little smaller in size, but this beautiful iridescent color. What's fabulous about this bee it, not only is it native to BC, uh, it's very docile, easy to raise, fun to teach kids with uh, about bees. 
Uh, it doesn't make honey, but it is uh, far surpasses the honeybee in its ability to pollinate, mostly because of its special hairs on its abdomen. This little guy or girl is another type of bee called the leaf cutter bee, again, a little smaller than the blue orchard. Now I know we were gonna talk about native pollinators. I recently found out that the leaf cutter is not native to North America. It came over from Turkey, but it is such a fascinating bee that we're gonna talk a bit about it. And also solitary like the mason bee and uh, very gentle and fun to work with. Uh, you'll see a lot of these on the prairies and down in Washington State. And this gorgeous little creature is the alkali bee. Notice the amazing iridescence on the abdomen, also equipped with a lot of special hairs. Excellent at pollinating the alfalfa fields of Washington State. And I will show you some amazing footage because I was able to go visit the alkali bee uh, in its native land of Walla Walla and Tushi, Washington, uh, just last summer. So you can probably imagine, or you can probably hear in my voice that I am very dedicated and excited about bees. These are just a fraction of the bees that live on this planet. Amazing sizes, shapes, colors, different hairs, different legs, uh, the diversity is amazing. In fact, there are 30,000 species of bees worldwide. Over 4,000 of the species are in North America alone. And BC has 450 of these species and counting. We are still discovering new subspecies every year. And what is so fascinating is that most of these species within BC and the world are both solitary and ground dwelling. So we really have to learn to look down to the ground uh, to those bees and make sure that we protect their habitat. I was gonna start with just doing a quick little course in pollination. Uh, pollinators are an indispensable part of a healthy environment and to a secure food supply. The top picture is showing a flower uh, that self-pollinates. A lot of those uh, crops would be corn, rice, and wheat, uh, self-pollinating self through the use of mostly wind. But almost 90% of the world's flowering plants rely on animals uh, to produce fruits and seeds, including 87 of the 128 global food crops. That amounts to about $243 billion Canadian, just on fruits and vegetables pollinated by bees. A third of everything we eat in a day has been pollinated by an insect. Uh, you may have heard in the media that some say we would starve without bees. Uh, this isn't true, but our diet would be extremely bland, full of mostly potatoes, corn, rice, wheat, uh, and it would lack a lot of the gorgeous fruits and vegetables that we rely on for uh, a large amount of our nutrition to stay healthy. Some of the big ones that we would lose out if we lost our pollinators are almonds. There's vast orchards of almonds, especially down in California, that are relying heavily on honeybees and mason bees at the moment moment. Apples, uh, blueberries. Blueberries uh, are doing really well with both honeybee and mason bees. Mason bees are excellent at fuzz pollination, which some blueberries require. Cucumbers, onions, pumpkins, strawberries, to name just a few of the, the really big crops. You'll also see a picture of uh, coffee there on the screen. I don't know what I do without my coffee, so those bees better not be going anywhere. Uh, the bees are also uh, vitally important for fruit set and for complete pollination. I often show uh, kids these pictures. You'll notice in the top left, those are cucumbers that were not adequately pollinated. The bees, or the number of bees did not visit uh, enough of the flower and make contact with the anther and stamen. 
and made these really little weird looking cucumbers. Uh, raspberries are off to the right of that, those little nubbly raspberries that you'll often see when you're um, maybe in uh, North Van or West Van picking raspberries and blackberries on the bushes. And then strawberries at the bottom. Uh, you don't often find strawberries that look like that at Whole Foods, but uh, you'll find them in your own garden and uh, maybe at farmer's markets. Still tasty, but look a little nobbly. So decline of pollinators. Uh, we have over 4,000 species of native bees in North America that have co-evolved with our native plants over millions of years. And they are experiencing catastrophic declines. Uh, loss of habitat is one of the big factors. In the top, you'll notice um, a picture of just a, a mono crop. We are planting vast amounts of single crops such as corn or wheat, uh, and it's just taking over the native habitats, uh, often habitats that have a lot of wildflowers that these native pollinators that are used to evolving with are, are missing. And in the bottom, uh, we have an urban setting. Uh, we are lucky in North Vancouver that we have a lot of green spaces and a lot of avid gardeners. Uh, I recently learned that honeybees actually do really well in urban environments uh, because so many people are planting blooming flowers and looking after them, um, adequately watering them, which produces a lot of nectar. Um, but other places with a lot more concrete, like in this picture, uh, are not as great for our native pollinators. Uh, there's a lot of mismanagement of some of our pollinating species. On the top is a picture of a giant truck filled to the gills with uh, honeybee hives. They will go around the country, uh, both the US and Canada, on trucks, uh, moving from monocrop to monocrop. Uh, they'll start in California and do almonds. Then they'll move uh, inland into the middle, um, the Midwest, and do uh, orchards or cucumbers, and then they'll get back on the track and move to watermelons. Uh, we are excellent as humans uh, managing bees, but uh, it is not great for the health of the bees. One, you know, moving them on trucks, and then also just giving them a one monocrop food source. Uh, we are also, when we run into problems with parasites or viruses, the easy way out is to add antibiotics to um, the bee um, life cycle. And for the short term, we can get away with it, but in the long term, we are creating generation after generation of bees that are not as healthy. But a lot of great work is being done at UBC and SFU to try and help this. So there is some positive things coming out of that. Uh, widespread use of pesticides. Uh, there's a lot uh, of spraying for mosquito control. Uh, the lower image is the green coating on corn. You may have heard of nicotinoids neonicotinoids in the media a lot. Uh, it's a derivative of nicotine. They coat the seed in this, in this picture, it's green. It's taken up by the seedling as it develops and provides protection from insects as the plant grows. Uh, there's a lot of controversy from different factor, factions about the effect this has on pollinators. Some say it isn't affecting them. A lot of the new research is saying it is. Uh, it seems that the neonics are actually in the pollen grains of the plants themselves. And then the bees pick this up and take them back to their hives. A lot of countries in Europe have banned the use of neonics and hopefully the US and Canada aren't far behind. We'll have to wait and see. And then uh, all of these factors uh, don't help disease virus and parasites that many of these bees encounter on a regular basis anyway. But uh, when we add to it the fact that we're moving them around the country and only providing them with one food source, 
uh, these diseases and viruses get hold of the bee colonies and they can't fight them off. The top picture is showing the Varroa destructor mite. You can see four or five red mites on the back of the bee. Uh, these actually develop uh, with the egg and larva within the cell and feed off of their food and then feed off of the bee themselves. It isn't great for the bee, and then it, it makes the whole hive as a group hard to fight off infection and viruses. And then uh, the lower picture shows something called uh, wing shriveling disease, I believe it's called. And again, if you don't have a healthy colony, they can't fight off these viruses. And cl climate change in, or climate disruption is another thing that's affecting our native pollinators. The top picture of that gorgeous bumblebee is the Franklin bumblebee, which we now believe is the first bumblebee to go extinct in the U.S. Um, as uh, climate change is providing stressful for these bees as they struggle to cope with the weather extremes. One of the key impacts is the shifting of seasons, which comes with less predictable weather patterns. And uh, the rapid changing of the season means that pollinators uh, kind of lose synchronicity with the flowering plants that they forage on. And bumblebees seem to be uh, quite, uh, they aren't able to um, go with these fast moving climate changes like some of the other bees. Uh, up to 40% of our pollinators may be at risk of extinction in the coming years, and that's it's kind of frightening. But not all hope is lost. I made this slide just to show you a few of the amazing societies and conservation organizations and community partners working together to change all this. Uh, in fact, May 20th is International Bee Day. Uh, if you see me, I will hopefully be wearing a fabulous bee hat and maybe a set of wings to celebrate. Uh, June 22nd and 28th is Pollinator Week. Uh, the Pollinator Partnership uh, is, is live and well in both Canada and the US. Uh, they're a great website if you want to check them out. They always have amazing initiatives. Uh, the Xerces Society, that's their logo in the top right corner. Uh, they have some fabulous free webinars on right now, and they are instrumental in trying to protect the monarch along with many other pollinating species. So lots of really positive things going on, and listening to this webinar is also uh, a fabulous way to just learn more, get excited, spread the word with your neighbors and your communities, and um, do as much as you can for them. So let's delve right into some of the pollinators that aren't bees first. Uh, the pictures on your screen, starting in the top left and moving around, are the hoverfly, then the beetle, uh, the wasp. Below the wasp is a bee fly, which I have some video of. It's a strange little creature. It looks a lot like a bumblebee, but hovers amazingly well. It's like a little drone. Moths and butterflies and hummingbirds. Uh, other things we haven't got in this picture are bats, uh, ants. Um, if you can think of any others that I haven't mentioned, please remind me. Uh, so bats, we won't touch on much today because uh, we have about 16 species of them in BC. But they're all insect eating. Uh, none of them help with pollination in BC. Uh, it's not until you get into the warmer tropical countries in South, uh, like Mexico and South America do you come across um, some bats that really help with cactus um, pollination. Uh, hummingbirds and butterflies drink nectar while hoverflies, wasps, beetles, and bees uh, visit flowers and take a combination of nectar and pollen. And then there's bees, which take it a step further. They visit, um, grab the pollen nectar for themselves, but also actively collect uh, the nectar and pollen for their young, which means they're visiting even more flowers and transferring more pollen. Hummingbirds, uh, we have the annas and the rufus, which are the two main ones here in Vancouver. 
Uh, the Anna's is found year round here. In fact, uh, the hummingbird is the official bird of Vancouver. Uh, they support a large number of native plants and the pollen is carried on both their beaks and their feathers. But because they don't have really elaborate hair system, they're not transferring a whole lot of pollen, but they are our primary bird for pollination in North America. And they are only in the New World. Uh, they are not in Europe. In fact, a friend uh, mentioned this creature, which I'd never heard of before. I thought, because uh, he, uh, he was in Europe and mentioned that he had seen a hummingbird, and I'm like, no, there's no way you did. It turned out that it was this guy. Uh, I'm hoping that some of you that are listening and watching have had the opportunity to see a hummingbird moth in the flesh. I hear that they are moving slowly up North America. Um, maybe one day uh, we will, one of the benefits of climate change is we may see a hummingbird moth, but uh, they can be seen in the UK, as far up as the UK, but a lot in uh, France and Italy and Spain, if you like the warmer uh, climates. But it looks so much like a hummingbird and that huge proboscis, I can see why people um, would think that it is a bird because it is huge. But I just thought I'd mention that, that fabulous creature. Moths and butterflies, these are three that are quite common in BC. Uh, there's about 187 species found in BC, but only a handful of them are common in urban centers. I have seen the swallowtail um, on occasion and the painted lady. Uh, a lot of people play with the painted lady for uh, raising in classrooms and doing fun releases at weddings and celebrations. Uh, they thrive in the grasslands of uh, coastal meadows of BC. And butterflies love um, seeking out nectar on daytime blooming flowers, whereas moths um, pollinate more night blooming flowers. And I think there was just an article out, Globe and Mail or some UK journal, saying that moths are actually, and butterflies are actually more useful at pollinating than we thought. Uh, the pollen does like to stay on their wings, which are covered with a whole bunch of very, very tiny little scales. So uh, new research coming out that they may be more valuable than we realize. This is a picture I took in Lower Lonsdale about two weekends ago. I think it is part of the comma butterfly family, could be a green comma, uh, not absolutely sure, but you can tell it's a butterfly from the bulbs at the end of its antennas. I was lucky to see that little guy. Uh, flies are another pollinator, not anywhere near as useful as uh, bees. Not something that we are going to raise in large numbers on an agricultural level, but uh, there's lots of hoverflies or flower flies in Vancouver. They're quite hard to discern between being a fly and a bee because they move so fast and they often mimic bees in looks and well, as you can see in these pictures. Uh, but what tells them apart is the large bulging kind of Google eyes and the fact that they have two wings. Bees have four wings. And I have a hard time um, discerning between bees and flies, but usually I can tell by how they fly. Uh, and I'm more of a hover than a, a fly, <laughs> a flying like a bee and their, uh, their wings are more triangular in shape. Uh, they also have very, very short antenna. You can see them kind of sticking out the front of their face there. They love open-faced fa small flowers uh, that bloom under shady conditions, and they're great at pollinating skunk cabbage, goldenrod, and members of the carrot family. So they're quite good at getting into those really tiny flowers, like the, uh, the carrot. If you've ever seen carrot go to seed, it's quite a delicate flower. And they're very useful pollinating those. And now, round of applause, we're on two bees. And I put in brackets there and wasps because we're going to talk just briefly about them. 
So the two big groups when it comes to bees are social and solitary. We're gonna start with social. Here we have pictures um, on the top of bees. The one on the left is of a giant honeybee hive attached to someone's um, roof. Uh, that is a monster. And then to the, to the right of it, that is a beehive that is recently swarmed. Um, quite docile as a group of bees right after they've swarmed. One queen has gone off with half um, they've raised a new queen and it's gone off with half the colony and this is how they um, reproduce and split hives uh, in their reproductive process. This often happens in springtime, so we're kind of around the time of swarming right now being, um, what day is it? It's May 14th. Uh, the lower uh, left-hand picture is of a wasp nest, uh, some sort of paper uh, building wasp, also a social insect, and the bottom right is of a bumblebee nest, something that not a lot of us know what it looks like. It's amazing and I have some video footage a bit later, uh, but they also live in social hive constructs. Uh, and that I will mention that social insects are quite We've been, as humans, quite good at managing social insects. We have much more, um, they're easier to manage. But, and obviously honeybees, we've been doing it for hundreds if not thousands of years, dating back to the Egyptians on the Nile. Uh, they would truck, or they'd boat ride actually, the hives up and down the Nile, moving them from crop to crop. Uh, but the bumblebees, we have also learned to semi-domesticate wasps, um, not as great at pollinating, so we haven't really gone that route. These are some wasps that are quite common in Vancouver. Uh, the paper wasps, the common yellow jacket, the bald-faced hornet. Um, the wasp, which, what makes a wasp quite different from a bee is the fact that their offspring needs meat. Um, not pollen and nectar. The wasp will go to plants for nectar, but they are really searching out that little piece of wiener from your picnic or hamburger or that little caterpillar or aphid on your favorite plant. So you'll often see them flying among um, your lawn or your plants looking for those little grubs to pick off and take back to their hive for their offspring. Um, just as an aside, uh, bees evolved from wasps, not the other way around. Um, I think it's not debated anymore. It's, almost, it's fact that evolutionary scientists believe that wasps were picking up pollen um, with their short hairs and taking it back to the nest and their offspring found a liking for the pollen more for, than the meat. And that's when uh, the, the uh, bees started to evolve off of wasps and go more for pollen. This is a picture of a wasp just to show you that they do have hairs um, on their abdomen and their, of their thorax, that middle section of their body, but nothing like a honeybee, what we're about to see. Look at that gorgeous creature covered in hair. Uh, it's on its legs, it's on its abdomen, its thorax. Honeybees even have hair coming out of their compound eyes. Um, and I've included a close-up picture of the actual hair structure. I found it just the other night. Uh, a close-up of the hairs on the thorax. Notice that each hair is branched, almost like split ends, enabling it to really trap pollen grains uh, between those little branches. I found this uh, set of pictures um, from a electron microscope, several different types of bee legs. Uh, you can see the hair is straight, it's branched, it's curly cute, it's corkscrewed. Uh, I had never realized how many different types of hair bees had. 
Uh, it's also an interesting fact that the hair helps the bee build up almost a, well, an electrostatic charge, um, which really holds the pollen close to its body. And the hair is also very insulating, uh, which is quite useful for some of the larger bees like the bumblebee, because they need to um, maintain a core heat so that they can get flying in the morning. So let's delve a bit more into the honeybee. Uh, you'll notice the pollen baskets on the back legs are also known as corbicula. Um, and bees are extremely neat and tidy. Um, they go from flower to flower, pick up the pollen on their abdomen, and then use some special comb like scopa on their legs to kind of form it into this pollen mound or ball. They also mix um, nectar with it, uh, which causes uh, it to form this nice little perfect packet. Uh, and you'll see honeybees all over North Vancouver uh, when the sun comes out. And I think most of the cherry trees have passed here, but they were just covering the cherry trees maybe about three weeks ago in the sun. And the trees were just alive with them. Uh, it's also become quite popular to rent hives. Uh, one of my colleagues at the library, her mom who lives uh, just off of uh, 29th in West Vancouver, has been renting a hive every summer for her um, beautiful garden. Unfortunately, last year a bear discovered it and decimated it, so it doesn't look like she'll be getting a hive back soon. But uh, I've also uh, seen hives on the roofs of certain buildings. Um, certain strata have taken upon themselves to rear bees. I believe there's a hive in Edgemont. If you're familiar with Bjorn Barn, they make a fabulous uh, butter scone. You take your butter scone and you take it up onto the roof and there's some hives up there. So coming much more um, trendy to have these guys in our urban spaces. This is just another picture of bee legs because, well, I love bee legs. Uh, Again, these are pollen baskets and just sh uh, showing how neat and tidy honeybees are. I thought I'd do a shout out to Megaly because I believe she's listening today. Uh, she owns a fabulous company called Bee Watch and her and her partner make amazing observation hives. Uh, this one I believe is from Bowen Island School. She uh, has set up some some hives there and also in um, some schools around West Vancouver. Um, it is my future goal uh, to possibly get an observation hive for the West Vancouver Memorial Library. I thought it would be amazing uh, have it as a teaching tool up maybe in the story house next to our other bee tree and uh, honeybees being a social insect uh, are absolutely fascinating to watch um, so if you have any questions about honeybees I highly recommend contacting Megaly and you can reach her at beewatch.ca Uh, these are two fun pictures. The one on the right, uh, it was going around social media a while ago. It was all about bee bums, and they are just so cute with their little feet sticking out of the flowers, so I had to include one. And then the one on the left, uh, just showing a gorgeous bumblebee, nice and hairy, um, but also quite neat and tidy when it comes to the world of bees, again with that pollen lump on the specialized leg. These are some of the bumblebee uh, species that you can find in BC. I often go on bee walks when it's a nice day and try to identify bumblebees, which is really hard to do. I went online and got a bee identification picture and I thought, oh, I can do this. All I have to do is count the number of segments on the abdomen and match it up with the colors. Well. There are so many different combinations of 
bands and colors. It is quite difficult to do. The one that's the easier of the six is the middle bottom one, the Volsoneski. Don't know if I'm saying that right, but mostly black with a yellow band at the base of the abdomen. That one I see around quite a bit. And being um, the month of May right now, you're going to see mainly um, female queens. Uh, they have a bit of a different life cycle from the honeybee. The honeybee uh, has one queen that can often live for many generations, um, you know, two or three years or more. And she will rear brood, um, which are the workers. The workers uh, will often have a quite short life cycle or a lifespan during the summer, um, I think three weeks, and then they die. Uh, but there are some of the hive that will actually overwinter with the queen and um, beekeepers will kind of hibernate the hive, wrap it, and then as it gets warmer through the next spring, um, she'll start rearing the brood again. So kind of multi-generational um, hives that go on and on. The bumblebee is a bit different because uh, an, the female queen will uh, leave the hive in, um, in the fall. She will find a mate and she'll be inseminated. She'll keep that sperm with her and she'll overwinter in loose leaf material or she'll um, dig a little in depression in the soil and she'll overwinter, hibernate, and then pop out next spring, at, which is this time right now in May, and start foraging and creating a tiny little honey pot. She will use that as her food source and once she has enough nectar, um, she will hunker down and start creating brood and workers. And then the workers will go out and start doing the foraging. Uh, as it gets closer to fall, she'll create some queens. Her life cycle will die, and those queens will go out and go through the whole process again. So a bumblebee hive is just an annual event. And I've included this video uh, to show you how a honeybee uh, or a bumblebee colony kind of interacts. You'll see. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but the queen bee is a large one, kind of a large moving uh, bee in kind of the bottom right quadrant. And then all of her workers, which are much, much smaller. Uh, the brood, I'll just pause that there. The brood um, where she'll keep her uh, growing offspring are in the lighter colored, um, containers. And then in the lower left, you'll see um, cells that have what looks like kind of a liquid. That's actually, that's their honey or nectar. It's not palatable to humans, but that's where they store that. And they're very dense little compact nests, um, usually no more than 300 bees. Uh, they're quite hard to raise. People on the internet will show you schematics for making bumblebee boxes. I've never had any luck with them because they're, they don't just like anywhere. And if the box is at all disturbed throughout the time they're in it, they'll just get up and leave. So they really like um, leftover bird boxes with nesting material in it or mouse holes or compost with a lot of um, grass. Uh, so yeah, you'll find these all over uh, Northwest, all over Vancouver. Bumblebees do something that no other bee can do quite as well, and that's something called buzz pollination. And I found this great video that really shows how they do it. Buzz pollination is needed for our tomatoes. Uh, BC is, in the Fraser Valley is known for its BC hothouse tomatoes, and they use um, boxes of bumblebees. They buy them, bring them in, and... Some bumblebee populations are in decline. 
a tragedy since they are among the few bees capable of buzz pollination. This technique is the only efficient way to pollinate plants like tomatoes, eggplants, and blueberries. The bumblebee grabs the flower by the anthers, decouples its flight muscles from the wings, and uses them to shake the flower violently. The only way to get the blossom to dislodge its pollen. which the bumblebees bring back to their colony. I thought that was just uh, an amazing clip, really showing the buzz pollination. You could see that it was vibrating, but it had disengaged its wings. So the wings weren't vibrating, but the whole flower was. And then the pollen was just coming out of the anther and coating its abdomen, which it would then scrape off and put on its pollen baskets. And like the narrator said, we use these in hot houses. Uh, it's much easier to buy a box of bumblebees than get a bunch of humans walking around the hot house with tuning forks, which I've seen people do. It does work, but that would take a really long time. So it's important to remember that most solitary bees are docile, non-stinging, extremely fun to watch. They're all over the North Shore. Uh, they often live in pre-existing cavities, uh, like the bottom picture on the right, or they dig their own tubes in the ground, uh, often with a little turret or mound of excavated dirt, which um, helps you locate their little tunnel. Uh, there's no honey production and there's no long lasting generation. These guys have quite short lifespans, um, four to eight weeks. They um, provision their broods, they provision their tube or um, nest with food and their offspring and then their life cycle is over. So uh, because of their short lifespan, it hasn't made um, their use in agriculture as efficient, but we are starting to use them in different ways. Uh, and the mason bee, the alkali bee, the leaf cutter bee are all things that we're using on larger scale for um, agricultural purposes. But I don't think we can call any of these domesticated uh, they're almost, they're just semi-domesticated. We're, we're working with them, um, but nothing to the extent of uh, the honeybee. These are two of my favorite solitary bees. Uh, they're known as hairy belly bees. On the left is the blue orchard mason bee, something that I have been raising for over 20 years in my backyard, uh, and the leaf cutter bee. Uh, mason bees are extremely common all over North Vancouver. Uh, leaf cutters less so, but uh, my friend Patty who lives in Lynn Valley has several of these. She has an old plastic table that she really wants to get rid of in her back garden, but she can't because there are leaf cutters in it, so she refuses to get rid of it. Uh, she also has one living in a potted plant. Uh, it's a cracked old pot, uh, but it it has a little hole through the crack, so she can't get rid of that either. Um, both of these can be purchased. Blue Orchard Mason Bees, um, you can get them at places like Wild Birds. Uh, leaf Cutter Bees, more so through mail order. But if you're just starting out with these bees, put up a house and see how you do for your first year, because often you will have success. Uh, if you have one hole that gets filled in your first year, I say you're doing well. So. Um, yeah, no need to go out and purchase them. Uh, just a close up shot of a leaf cutter, hairy belly, just to really get across the, the amazing hair structures on their abdomens. Mason bees, while well, we're most, um, most common in North Vancouver is the blue orchard. There's many in the species. Uh, 
Number one shows a Carter B. Number two is some sort of mason that uses more of a resin material, not a mud. Then number three looks like some sort of mason B using um, cut pieces of bamboo, it looks like. Number four is a mason B that will only use discarded snail shells. I think that's so cool. I'm not quite sure which country that's in. And then number five, um, showing how effective mason bee are at raising in um, almost artificial surroundings. Uh, these are different types of drilled holes and tray methods. And if you have any questions about how to start raising mason bees, which um, way you should go, whether you should get cardboard tubes or straws or trays, um, you can always send me an email because I could just do a whole other webinar on housing for mason bees. So we're not gonna get too much into that, but different mason bees use different materials. Um, some use mud, resin, plant hairs, pebbles, masticated pulp of leaves. They will use crevices in bark and rock and old insect holes, uh, dead wood, pithy plant stems. I've heard stories of using teapot spouts, um, that hole in your stereo where your earphone jack goes in, you'll find them there. Um, this year, one is living in the bottom of my dad's um, chair that's on the deck. And you'll just find them anywhere because um, they are very adaptable to our more urban um, landscape. In fact, they look less to nature now, uh, uh, less into the trees and the bushes and look for man-made objects like shingles and roof siding and that kind of thing. I had to include this gorgeous specimen. This is the Blue Orchard Mason Bee. Um, as I said, a little smaller than a honeybee. Unbelievable hair structure. This is a female. You can tell by her short antenna and her jaws. The jaws are not for biting, stinging, anything like that, but to actually hold the mud that she uses to line her nest holes. Um, often people think that they're seeing a blue bottle fly, but it's in fact a mason bee because when the sun hits a mason bee just right, it has this kind of iridescent blue black sheen to them. And absolutely gorgeous. This uh, is a picture of the mason bee tree at the library. We have it on the story house balcony up on the second floor near the youth department. Um, our maintenance man Chad helped, well actually didn't help me, he built the whole darn thing, uh, out of reused and recycled and upcycled pieces of wood from around the district. Uh, he got this log from Parks and he drilled a bunch of huge holes in the side and he made a fabulous kind of shingle roof. And with the help of my dad who made all the tube inserts, um, we have, we just added some new ones this year, but we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, I think if you go all the way around. And each of those blocks holds, I don't know, maybe 30 tubes. So we are gonna have a bumper crop this coming year. Uh, I was just at the library and they are, they are really flying. Chad sent me the middle, middle picture of a female. Again, you can tell by the jaws at the front who was basking in the sun the other day. And then one of the blocks of tubes is almost filled and you'll see two females doing the end cap on the right picture there. Uh, I use a wood block with then a cardboard tube liner and then a paper liner in that, which allows me to clean the bees uh, quite easily. That is also another topic that we could get into, all about how to take the tubes out, clean the cocoons for the next year. And you'll see on the left, there's a white box at the top that actually holds the mason bee cocoons. They will exit the box. Uh, in spring and go right into the house, or at least that's the hope. And uh, when the libraries reopen, please come and check out the mason bee tree. These uh, little guys fly from March to June. Most of them will be finished by the beginning of June, but then other um, pollinators will start using crevices and holes in the um, 
in the tree. So you can come and look at those too. This is a picture of uh, on the right of our back porch at my parents' house, um, just to show you that we've gone a little crazy over 20 years. Uh, and like I said, I prefer using a wooden house with a tube liner. The trays at the top you'll see uh, right underneath the light are where I place all the cleaned and dried cocoons. And then on the left is a picture of Patty's back deck. And she has a very similar way of doing it. Um, the upper ones are ones my dad made for her, but the lower ones her husband went crazy with a drill bit and some two by fours. That also works. Uh, you'll also see on my photo that there's some wood with even smaller drilled holes um, that will encourage bees that are flying later in the year, all solitary, all non-stinging. Some of them are wasps, wasps that will pick aphids off of your plants and use um, different types of resin instead of mud. And uh, you can encourage them into your backyards as well. This is uh, the mason bee. On the left is the male mason bee, I, uh, and then the female on the right. Uh, the male is a bit smaller than the female, has extremely long antenna, and this fabulous bush, bushy mustache on its front face. And then the female, bigger in size, these great um, mandibles for picking up mud and manipulating it in her nesting tube and then a much shorter antenna and then just lots of glorious hairs everywhere i took this video uh several weeks ago when we had that really nice um weather and the males always hatch first and then start patrolling the bee houses until the female pops out. And when he sees her, he grabs onto her. They often fall to the ground. In this case, I transferred them to a little side table. And then I just started um, filming them with my Samsung iPhone. Uh, and Sometimes they stay coupled like this for a minute, sometimes 10 minutes. It just depends how long she'll put up with this. And, oh, and right there she pooped, which is something they all do when they first hatch. You would too if you were in a cocoon for an entire winter. Uh, so you know they're healthy if they do this first poop. And they've turned towards us and you can see the long antenna on the male um, and the bushy front face of him. Uh, let's just keep, see what else they're gonna do. I could take videos of bees forever and I usually do. So thank you for watching these. We'll go to the next one, which I think is even closer up. So when he um, fertilizes her, I guess we could say, uh, his wings will often start to vibrate and his abdomen will extend and go underneath hers. Uh, and so it's quite fascinating to watch. Kind of a cool photo. So uh, this is happening on our back deck all through the month of March and April. And it's just, they're fun to watch. They don't bother us, they don't bother my pets. They're often on the ground and we just transfer them to a flower. Um, thank you for again bearing with me, but uh, I was having fun with my slow-mo feature on my phone and I set it up. And there, there you could see her with a giant piece of mud in her front jaws. And then this one coming in, you can actually see uh, the proboscis, how they uh, sip nectar kind of tucked under her head. And I love how the slow-mo just makes them kind of look like little helicopters. Oh, and then she's off. She still has mud in her, her front mandibles. And this one will go in and oh, there she is again with her mud. 
So you can just uh, get a drink, a cup of tea, go on your back deck and watch these guys for hours. It's very meditative. And just uh, speak quickly about the life cycle. Uh, the female will hatch, like I said, in March, and she will find hopefully a beautiful tube that you've provided for her. She'll enter the tube and she'll mark it with a scent, we think, to kind of say, hey, everyone, this is my uh, tube. She will then go out and start foraging for nectar and pollen, and she will make something called bee bread or bee butter, which is a lump of very rich in protein and carbohydrates for the offspring lump of pollen and nectar. She'll lay an egg on it, and then to keep that offspring nice and safe, she will create a perfect mud wall. Uh, some people say that you need to provide your mason bees with mud. I have never found this to be the case. They seem to have no trouble finding mud in North and West Vancouver. So they go out and grab the mud, make the wall, and then they go forage again for nectar and pollen, make another lump of bee bread, lay an egg, you get the idea, make a wall, bee bread, egg, wall, all the way to the end. And what's so interesting is she can choose the sex of her offspring. If it is a fertilized egg, it is a female. If it is a non-fertilized egg, it's a male. She always puts females to the back of the tube and males at the front. Uh, she knows that if a predator comes along, like a bird with a very long beak or a rat with little pinchy claws, it will eat the baby at the front, which is always going to be a male. I call them the sacrificial males. There's often two to three at the front. Uh, and the females are nice, nice and safe at the back. Uh, this is another reason why we always want to tell people to drill as deep a hole or create a straw that is long as possible. That promotes maximum percentage of female to male ratio of the brood, because if you provide them with a very short tube, she's only gonna lay a male in there. Uh, I suggest at least three and a half or longer inches for a nesting tube. A great little video here. In the season, our female red mason bee has also been building her nest in whole tubes. However, unlike the leafcutter bee, she constructs hers out of mud. If you keep a keen eye out in spring, you might very well see red mason bees like these, mining for mud. They will often return to the same location each time they need to collect more material, making an average of eight trips to build a single cell. Once each cell is constructed, she must then fill it, because in addition to providing her offspring with a place to live, she must also provide them with enough food to last them until adulthood. For solitary bees, this means visiting flowers to collect nectar and pollen in great abundance. Red mason bees are highly efficient pollinators. A single female is thought to do the work of 60 honeybees. This is believed to be a result of how their bodies are adapted to carrying large amounts of pollen. Underneath their abdomen, they have a special organ called a scopa, a collection of stiff hairs that they load to the limit. Yet, despite this remarkable carrying capacity, it may still take her an entire day to fill just a single cell. She regurgitates nectar from her crop, which will supply her young with essential sugars for energy. she has collected will provide her young with protein for growth. This mixture is commonly known as bee butter. What took her an hour to collect is offloaded in a few seconds. And she is immediately off for more. Wanted to the season. That video 
because I had never found um, footage of a mason bee offloading its abdomen of pollen like that before and also regurgitating nectar to create the bee bread. I thought that was so cool. Uh, how effective one, the electrostatic charge of her abdomen hairs had kept the pollen so tight and then how effective she was with her legs at scraping it off. So I just thought that was super cool. Uh, a little video from my back deck of the mason bee uh, finishing off the final mud cap. Uh, you can often, uh, they use all sorts of different materials, uh, different types of mud. Some is sandy, some is more clay based, and all the different end mud caps will be different colors. And she will often um, have kind of a dummy cell behind this um, final cap. She almost knows that a bird's going to come. So there will be no baby for about an inch behind this um, final wall, and then there will be um, the bee bread and the offspring. And I just think that's amazing what she does. She has a little, you can see a little neck and she's a really good at manipulating the mud and kind of creating this beautiful little concave wall. I had mentioned before that different sized holes will attract different pollinators throughout the year. And just to show you that, um, I did a cross section of some of the bugs or insects that have come to my back deck. So the first one, obviously the mason bee, and those are the fully formed uh, adults within their dark brown cocoons. Uh, then the leaf cutter, which we'll talk about in a moment, but lines its cell not with mud, but with perfectly little moon shaped pieces of leaf. Uh, the next one down is the Hopolitus bee, uh, uses a macerated leaf pulp. I don't see a lot of those around, um, but they're an early summer pollinator. Also solitary, also non-stinging, docile. Then the Carter bee, um, it flies all summer. Uh, they're quite rare in North Vancouver. Uh, I've had them one year, and I think a friend of mine over by Cap Mall may have one in her house. But carter bees are fantastic because instead of mud or leaf, they card or collect that fuzz that you'll often find on lamb's ear plants or other kind of fuzzy white material. And she'll gather that and use it as the basis uh, to hold the bee bread and the baby. It just keeps it nice and warm. Uh, another thing about carter bees is the males are quite territorial. Um, so if they find uh, plants that they really like, they'll stake it out for themselves and they will fight with other bees if they come too close to pollinate those plants. This is the aphid wasp. Uh, I have quite a few of these. Uh, they again uh, are in summer. They like the warmer weathers. They, they live in a very tiny hole, maybe an eighth of an inch, two eighths. Uh, and then I was unrolling one of my tubes and for some reason, all of the babies came, uh, made it to adulthood, but then none of them could exit the hole. I have a feeling an, a different species uh, came and plugged it with something, but it made it for a great picture. And they have uh, these great jaws. And yes, that is a solitary wasp and it picks aphids off your rose bushes, parasitizes them, and shoves them in their hole, lays an egg on it, and then uses pine resin instead of mud. And the potter wasp is at the top. Um, they fly all summer uh, and they use mud stocked with small caterpillars and beetle larvae for their babies. And then next one down is the grass carrying wasp. Uh, colleague of mine, Andrea, had a bunch of these in Burnaby last year, and she shared a few with me. I think they hatched and didn't come back, but they shove grass and love to collect grasshoppers, tiny tree grasshoppers, and shove them in their hole, parasitized and paralyzed for their offspring to slowly suck, suck their juices. And then I, last year across the road, our neighbors had some of our houses and they got these two 
um, species, which I don't, I've never seen before. And they shared some of the cocoons with us. I think on the left, it is a Californicus, Californica mason bee of some sort. And on the right, I don't yet know what that is. So I'm excited to see one when it hatches, most likely later in summer and um, what comes out. So just go crazy with uh, your drill bits. Make all sorts of different sized holes and all sorts of things will come live in your backyard. And just for fun, uh, a friend of mine just moved to the UK. I'm doing a pollinator talk today. And, and I'll, I'll put that on mute in here in the background. And her parents have one of my houses. They uh, live outside of Liverpool. And she just sent this a few hours before I started doing this webinar. I think they are red mason bees, like that bee that we saw in the video. And I just thought it was so cool that mason bees all over this planet are pollinating and living in houses. So now we are on to my second uh, favorite hairy belly bee. This is the leaf cutter bee. And I think I mentioned before how they're not quite as common in North Vancouver as say the mason bee, but uh, you can still see them around. My friend uh, Patty has one living in her uh, old table in Glen Valley and she can't get rid of her uh, table because well, the leaf cutters are living in it. Uh, they make these fabulous little half moon shapes out of leaves. Sometimes it is your rose bush, sorry to say, but uh, excellent pollinators. And they tuck this little leaf under their abdomen and kind of fly around on it like a, a little flying carpet. Uh, there is a native leaf cutter to the Pacific Northwest. And then there's also one that's been brought in from Turkey. Uh, and they do have a similar uh, life cycle and pattern to the mason bee. Here's a awesome little video I found. It seems this one is just right. <laughs> Leafcutter bees, as their name suggests, make their nests out of cut leaves. If you've ever seen circular holes like these in rose plants or Himalayan honeysuckle, then you can be sure there are leafcutters nearby. The leaf cutter has specially evolved mandibles that are excellent for cutting leaves. They are broader at the tip with a serrated edge, and this allows them to slice through tough plant material with very little effort. Back at the nest, she carefully folds the leaf into place and cements it down with her own saliva. This provides a safe environment in which her offspring can grow up. I thought that was just a great video seeing how effective they are at manipulating that little perfect piece of leaf and they will line the entire tube with it so when you crack open a tube if you're cleaning your tubes at all and you come across it'll one of these guys it'll look like a perfect kind of cigar of little um, pieces of leaf sometimes uh, certain species will use beautiful pieces of cut petal and you'll open it up and there'll be like a rainbow of petal pieces now I mentioned before that I had the um, opportunity to go down to Washington State with some friends my long-suffering friends uh, Gabriel Angela and Mark I dragged them all over uh, Washington State kind of south eastern Washington state around Walla Walla and Tushi. Uh, and we were uh, lucky enough to see the alfalfa leaf cutter and the alkali bee uh, doing their thing. One thing that both the alfalfa and the alkali are excellent at is pollinating alfalfa. And before I tell you a bit more about that, I'm going to show you a video about how good they are at manipulating the alfalfa blossom because 
they don't mind getting bopped on the head, which you'll see in a moment. But pollinating alfalfa flowers is a lot trickier than it looks. Even honeybees can't really hack it. Here's why. Alfalfa keeps its pollen locked away inside its flowers. To get it, the bees have to step on a spring-loaded petal called a keel petal. Here's how it works. Pop! It releases this column that has the pollen at the end. It's called tripping the flower. Here it is again. The column has some force. The bee might get a good thwack in the face. Leaf cutting bees just don't care. They can take a punch. Pop. Honeybees don't really like to tangle with that. They'll usually step around gingerly, trying to sip nectar from the side without setting it off. Leaf cutting bees get coated in pollen and bring it back home to their nest so they can pack it in there to feed their growing babies. And there's that picture of the cigar I was telling you about. And these are actually in styrofoam blocks which let's just move forward for a moment. These are trucks or containers filled with these styrofoam blocks. This is the one I got to see uh, in one of the alfalfa fields. You notice that there are strange symbols and writing on the front of the styrofoam. Um, the, the thought is that it helps the bees uh, locate the actual hole. They would be saying to themselves, I'm the hole. Um, two over and one up from the letter Z. That's the thought anyway. And uh, kind of high contrast, blue and whites against the black. There's uh, machines that these will, you actually feed these styrofoam blocks into the machines and it punches all the leaf cutter cocoons out of it. And I will uh, pop that uh, video of that machine um, in the resources at the end. So alfalfa leafcutter bees are raised uh, both in the Canadian prairies. Uh, the uh, prairie farmers actually raise the bees themselves and then ship the bees down to uh, the Pacific Northwest, uh, Washington State. And then those farmers in Walla Walla and Tushi um, hatch the bees and use them solely as pollinators uh, of their alfalfa fields, not to make alfalfa, but alfalfa seed. This area of the Pacific Northwest makes up to 25% of the alfalfa seed in North America. And to give you an idea, let's see, press play. These are trays filled with the alfalfa cocoons, the little pieces of leaf and it's a warm day in June and they are hatching like crazy. Uh, very docile, couldn't care less. They have nothing to defend, thus their docileness. Uh, these are some uh, farmers that are just kind of moving them around and uh, putting more into one tray. And then in a moment you'll see they'll lift the tray and they'll put it into these um, kind of huts that are in the middle of the alfalfa fields. And the huts uh, contain both these trays of hatching bees and then all these styrofoam blocks that are going to hopefully be where the alfalfa leaf cutter uh, provisions her new brood and offspring while she is pollinating the field. Here they go, they're gonna lift it up. And I saw them flying um, like this, just hundreds, well, thousands of them. and they're just coating the backs of the farmers. It's pretty cool to see. And there's that picture of the, the alfalfa. Now, along with the alfalfa leaf cutter, I mentioned the uh, native alkali bee. Um, I'd never heard of these guys until I read a fabulous book called Buzz. Um, 
And this is the only place in the world, to my knowledge, and along with the alfalfa seed farmers, that has a speed limit enforced for insects. And this is actually a bee crossing sign. You must uh, abide by 25 miles per hour when it's hatching season, which is most of June and July, because the bees fly at about three to five feet above the ground, and you can actually hit quite a few of them uh, if you're going too fast. And then you can see the alfalfa field in, behind the bee crossing sign. This is just some close-up pictures of the alkali bee uh, with this beautiful iridescent abdomen. Uh, they live in the ground. I mentioned they are native and very localized to this particular part of the state of Washington. Uh, and while they do carry some pollen on their abdomen, you can see their really fuzzy leg hairs that is holding most of the pollen. And they uh, make small turrets around their holes um, with a mixture of dirt and saliva, or bee spit, and that's how you can identify um, where their little nesting holes are. Again, a closer picture of the abdomen and the beautiful bee. Uh, this is a picture of some of their nests. Uh, 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 Ground-dwelling bees can uh, nest socially or by themselves. So several females can go into uh, a tube and then offshoot into her own little brood cells, or they can just use one tube per uh, female. Similar to the mason and the leaf cutter, they are provisioning certain cells with food, laying an egg on it. The larval will. Uh, over winter in the ground and then pop out next spring. Uh, some of the ground nesting bees also coat the insides of their tunnels with kind of a waterproof secretion that helps uh, through the winter. And these are just showing some more tunnels uh, for different mining bees. Uh, they come in all different shapes and sizes, lengths, some go down, some go out. So that was an interesting picture. And this is showing the artificial alkali bee beds that the farmers make around their alfalfa farms. Uh, the bees would have in a natural surrounding have found uh, an alkali rich, silty place in which to raise their brood, but the farmers figured out the perfect mixture of moisture and salt and made these vast, um, we call them artificial bee beds. In fact, you can see them from Google uh, Satellite. I found these last year uh, when I was researching where exactly I wanted to go to see them, and I was circling them with red. And you can see how uh, closely uh, situated they are to the alfalfa fields because uh, unlike the honeybee, which can go travel for kilometers looking for food, Alkali bees are similar to masons. They have a very short travel distance. Masons can only go about 300 meters from their home. Uh, I mean, they can go further, but they choose to do short uh, runs for food. Alkalis can do a bit longer, up to a kilometer, 800 meters to a kilometer, but uh, they like to stay close to home. And we were there in the second week of June. It was quite warm, quite windy in this valley. And I wanted you to get a sense. day progresses, uh, more and more start to fly, and they fly at about three to five feet, and they're just everywhere. I was in heaven. At one point, I was lying in the middle of the bee bed. My friends thought I was insane, but that's okay. Uh, and here is a video that Mark took. I've cut the sound, but you get a sense of how low flying they are. 
often the bee beds are on a bit of a, a slope and all this piping is to produce the perfect moisture content for them. The, it's, a, it's a science now. The farmers work with a lot of researchers at Oregon State University and Washington State University. Uh, they're doing a lot of research on how to uh, still use certain pesticides on the alfalfa, um, but not harm the bees. They often spray at night when the bees are in their tubes. Um, resting. Uh, so some really cool stuff coming out of those universities. And they're just so many bees flying. And they could have cared less about any of us. They were just intent on going to the fields, getting their pollen, bringing it back to their tube, back and forth, back and forth. So uh, the alkali bee is a type of mining bee. I don't think we can say that we have domesticated the alkali bee. Uh, I think we'd say we're semi-domesticated. Uh, but there are many, many different mining bees all over the North Shore. Uh, you can uh, notice them either by little turrets, but most like the alkali bee, but most of the ones in North Van just create this little mound, similar to the one in the bottom right corner. And like you saw with the leaf cutter, the mason and the alkali bee, these guys also like to aggregate together. None of them are working in tandem in a hive complex, but uh, they will often share tubes uh, and they love to uh, just have neighbors. These are um, pictures of a few more mining bees. Uh, Sweat bees are also quite common in North Van. They're very, very tiny. I often find them on dandelions or buttercups. Some, if you're lucky, are even bright, if you get to see them, are bright metallic green. Now, this is not a native bee, but I had to include this video when I found it because, you know, I'm all about the slow-mo videos. This is a native bee from the West in Santa Monica Mountains. And it has just been made with these amazing pollen pants. I mean, it looks like it's wearing, I don't know, big jogging pants. And it's getting ready to go watch some Netflix or something. But she is so laden down with pollen. She looks kind of drunk. And then all of a sudden, you're like, where is she going? And there's her turret to her, and she's just like squeak, 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 and she's just pulling her legs in, and boop. I just thought that was a great video. They are just so well equipped with all those hairs on their legs to do what they need to do. Um, my friend Gabriel and I were wandering around Lower Lonsdale, kind of by Neptune in the grain elevators, Come and we came across. So maybe three weeks ago, came across just Adrena, Adrena um, mining bees hatching out of someone's lawn. Uh, I know you can't see too much detail, but you can see the vast numbers of them. It was the first really warm day, maybe 18 degrees, and I just started filming. Uh, and they were just, I hadn't seen uh, a nest of these, I call them a nest, it's not really a nest, but a kind of field of hatchers like this, um, such a big one, quite a while. You can really see them flying against the window there. Also very docile, not at all interested in us. And these are the same bees. I just was able to take kind of some close-ups. Uh, the one on the left is a little mining bee uh, on some Pierre Straponica. And Mining bees from the Andrina uh, family have something called facial foveas, which is kind of a vertical eyebrow in between their eye and their antenna. And you can really see it. It's kind of a little yellow spot right beside the eye on the one pictured on the left. The one on the right, you can kind of see her, see her facial fovea and she is on a dandelion. Uh, my long-suffering friend Patty in Lynn Valley, who I've talked about before, she has this lovely little patch of mining bees in her front yard. She's had it for years, uh, and not the best 
just footage, but I just wanted to show that they are everywhere. She loved this plot of Mighty Me so much that Telus wanted to dig it up to give her a new Telus line. And she said, absolutely not, because you're going to go through my mining bees. So she still does not have a jealous line. And two weeks after she took that footage, I paid a visit to her house and took my slow-mo camera and got to see in the flesh a bee fly. I hope you can see it on the left there. Um, its wings beat so fast, almost faster than a hummingbird's, that um, it looks like it well, it's hovering. Uh, and this is amazing. This is a bee fly, so it is of the fly family, and it is flying over the mining bee holes. It is what's called a kleptoparasite. Bees have kleptoparasites. Um, sorry, there are bee kleptoparasites, there are fly kleptoparasites, and the object of their life cycle is to shoot their egg, get their egg somehow onto the food source of another species so that their offspring can use that food source um, and, and survive in the process, usually killing the insects uh, that they've taken over the, the home of. So this bee fly does something quite interesting. She will actually rub her uh, lower abdomen in sand, which I did get to see, it's not in this um, video. And she has a compartment in the back of her abdomen where her eggs are, and she um, kind of shoots sand up into this um, fold and coats her eggs with sand. Uh, we think it's so that it kind of disguises them. And then, like the video shows, she is going over the uh, mining bee holes, and she kind of twerks her abdomen and shoots eggs uh, down into whatever she thinks is a mining bee hole in the hopes that her offspring will eat the food source, kill the mining bee, and her progeny will survive. Um, I've heard of bee flies shooting eggs at like eyelets in people's shoes because she can't really tell what is a hole and what isn't. Um, she, all she can see is the high contrast. So I just thought that was a really uh, cool picture. Uh, and they have this crazy um, nectar feeding nose proboscis that makes them kind of look like a cross between a bee and a hummingbird. But again, they're in North Vancouver. And just wanted to show you a few plants that are common around the North Shore that bees love. Uh, on the left is, I believe, a laurel bush. I found this right behind the library in the fire lane and it was covered with mining bees and some other digging bees that are a little bit larger. And then on the right is Pieris japonica. You'll see this everywhere. The parks and district employees love um, planting this, mostly because it well has a beautiful kind of cascading um, berry flower and then this beautiful red leaf that you can see in the background. On the left here is flowering currant. Uh, see that a lot, beautiful fuchsia pink flowers. And then on the right is Oregon grape, which is a native to uh, BC. Bees also just love that one. On the left is flowering willow. Uh, I recently learned how important this is for pollen bees, all sorts of bees, bumblebees, honeybees, little bees, all love uh, willows. I haven't found one yet. Uh, in my community, but when I do, I'm going to have my camera ready. And then on the bottom there, sunflowers, um, asters and sunflowers, bees absolutely love. And on the top right, I thought I'd show a uh, daffodil. Now they are not great at providing uh, ample pollen for the bees, but what the bees love these uh, kind of horn-shaped flowers for is a place to rest and get warm. Uh, someone told me about a paper that talked about uh, how the temperature within the trumpet and on the petals can be up to 10 degrees warmer than the surrounding air. So bumblebees will often use this as a way to warm up their flight muscles in the morning. And then this has a little, uh, I don't know if it's a sweat bee, 
or mining bee, and it's just using this as a kind of a little warming hut. So uh, by all means, keep planting those tulips and daffodils. And then just thought I'd finish things off with a few ideas on how to attract bees to your backyard. Uh, it's always a good idea to group native flowers together in large patches. This allows the bees to not have to travel too far between um, food sources and native flowers are the key. Um, our native pollinators have evolved over millennia with the native flowers. So they are gonna go to those first before any of the introduced species. Uh, plant a variety of shapes and sizes uh, that bloom year round because uh, you will start with mason bees and as the year or as the year uh, progresses and gets warmer you'll move into leaf cutters and berry bees and aphid eating wasps and they'll they'll continue to come to your garden bees prefer white yellow and blue flowers some of uh the favorites in my community for blue are like borage and cat mint i see a lot of those down on the seawall covered with uh, bees Whereas hummingbirds prefer more white, red, and orange. And please avoid using pesticides at all costs. You can always find some sort of natural um, concoction to do the work you need. This is just a quick little list, top native plants and top garden plants. Um, fireweed is a, a big one, salal, salmonberry, organ grape. I mentioned the asters. Um, heather is an early spring bloomer, rhododendron. Uh, so anything that blooms in the early spring is a great one for the, the really early guys like the mason bees. And then create habitat. Provide a shallow dish of water with rocks. This isn't, isn't absolutely mandatory, but both bees, hummingbirds, and just uh, feeder uh, seed birds will love a little water bath. Um, Protect natural habitat and keep areas undisturbed. Uh, very important. Let dead trees stand and fallen logs lie. Uh, you'll be surprised at what nooks and crannies uh, bees will find and use. Uh, even if you have uh, like a dead tree in your backyard, uh, don't get rid of it. Drill a bunch of holes into it or um, break it up a bit. Uh, you'd be surprised what will start living in it and leave bare ground and leaf litter for nesting bees. Uh, the leaf litter is great for overwintering bumblebees and the bare ground, whether it's sandy or muddy or silty, um, the, the bees will choose their preference and hopefully you'll get some ground nesting bees. They are also excellent at aerating soil. And just a little note on uh, bee boxes. Uh, You'll often see these in places like Costco or um, pet stores. The one on the left uh, shows uh, pieces of bamboo and reed, whereas the one on the right is some pieces of tree with drill holes, but mostly bamboo. Um, these are cheap and kind of fun to play with. I have to admit, I did buy one and I have it up in the Okanagan at my cabin to just play around and see and have fun with it. But the reeds like pictured on the left, some people feel that as the mason bee enters these holes, the small spines inside the reed um, kind of shred at their wings, which isn't great. And the, uh, the diameters are very inconsistent. You can see it on the right. So many different strange diameters of uh, bamboo are great masons really prefer a 5 16th hole. Um, again, these are fun. Um, oh, another thing you'll notice is the depth of the cut reed and bamboo pieces is not uh, too vast in length. Um, I always suggest uh, three and a half to four inches at least if you're going to go ahead and drill a hole. Um, but I will show you what I prefer. This is one thing I love. Uh, you'll see these in Europe a lot in farmer's fields. A friend sent me a picture from France. She just came upon this, um, not this one precisely, but another one. Uh, they just used different bits of hay, masonry, um, pine cones, uh, rolled up mats. You get the idea, just little bits of pithy, 
um, stems and reeds if you are cutting back any of your um, raspberry canes, you can pop them in here. And then these are a few of the ideas that I think are best for our native pollinators. In the top left, it's a piece of PVC pipe and then someone has rolled their own straws. It looks like a mixture of computer paper and newspaper and parchment paper. All of those work really well. A variety of lengths you can see. I suggest again four to six inches is perfect. The bottom left is the tray method. Um, also excellent, really easy to clean your bees with that method. Uh, on the top right is the one I prefer and use. I um, have a wood substrate and then my dad drills very long holes um, in which I put the cardboard tube with then a paper liner. Uh, you can also use these to put into a piece of PVC pipe or a can, just like the one on the lower right, which is something I do with the kids at the West Vancouver Library. We get a can, we roll some computer paper around an HB pencil, and we shove it in the can. Um, sometimes it works. It's really a good exercise to do with the kids, um, but you will have the most success with the other three on this slide. Um, the other idea I could suggest is go to a really good nature store like um, Wild Birds Unlimited. They will get you set up with the perfect starter um, house and give you a quick lesson on how to make it last for several years. So investing in a $30 or $40 house, you know it will last for many, many years. And if you have the ability to put in these liners uh, even longer than that, uh, if you have any questions at all about um, how to start your Mason Bee House, I'm always available. I'll have my email at the end. You can always find me at the library. I'll include some more resources um, with uh, this webinar on the YouTube channel. And yeah, just contact me if you, if you need anything at all. So I'm going to end uh, this presentation with this amazing a video clip uh, from a Disney nature movie called Wings of Life. It came out in 2015. I know a lot of you now have the Disney Channel uh, if you have families, so you can watch Frozen 20 times a day, uh, and you can actually find Wings of Life on the Disney Channel. So I'll see you on the other side of this little four minute clip to answer some of your questions.
amazing way to end this. Uh, who's with me and wants to go on a field trip to Mexico? Uh, if my friends are listening, that's where we're going next. I'm just going to drag you down to Mexico to look at the monarch butterflies. So, so get ready. Uh, I wanted to include uh, this slide, uh, which you can pause on once you see, once I upload this to YouTube. Um, some of my favorite the online resources. I could highly recommend uh, the Xerces Society YouTube channel. They have some amazing webinars. Uh, the Oregon State University Extension Service uh, have this fabulous podcast called Paula Nation. Highly recommend it. Talks about uh, honeybees, native bees. I've been listening to it a bit too much, uh, but fabulous source of information. And then pollinator partner partnership at the bottom there. There's a US site that's a bit a bit more robust than the Canadian site, but they are doing some, some excellent work as well. And now we're going to just take a moment to answer some of your questions. So I'm just going to pause it here for a moment while I bring up the, uh, the question box. And while I'm, if you just give me a moment to do that, I'm just going to leave this site uh, this slide up, it just uh, shows some of the photo credits and film credits. So I thought we'd answer a few questions. Um, first one, with so many people keeping bees now, do they compete with or overwhelm native bees? Excellent question. Um, I think within this community, we are okay, because we have such a vast um, amount of pollen available. Um, I did watch a webinar recently called Bees in the Trees out of Oregon State um, Extension Service. And it was talking about all the different places bees find pollen that we aren't even aware of. They're not only going to the beautiful blooms that we uh, plant for them but they're going to the trees, they're going to the maples and the aspens and the pines, and they are getting uh, pollen from these trees that rely on wind to spread their pollen. And there are trillions of grains. Uh, so I think if we can just keep uh, providing clean, excellent habitat for these bees, um, we shouldn't have a problem with um, competing a native with honey. Uh, I think there's lots of resources to go around. Is it too late to clean out and restart my mason bee house? Haven't had much luck with it. So today uh, on the taping of this, we're looking at uh, May 14. Uh, my bees have been flying for about three weeks. So it would have been best to have put up your house a little prior to this, but I suggest um, get your bee house cleaned out uh, remount those holes if there's no one in it. You can put it in your oven and just give it a little heat up to make sure that all the pollen mites that they often harbor are dead. Uh, and put that house up. I'm seeing a question lower down that says, do mason bees like sun or shade? So I'll answer that. Um, I'm assuming you mean, yeah, do bee houses like sun or shade? I suggest on a south facing side of your house, they love morning uh, sun. It helps them get their flight muscles going. You'll often see them come out of their tubes and the girls start moving their jaws and then they'll kind of uh, perch on the front of the house and warm up in the sun. Uh, but you don't absolutely have to have that. Uh, your first year, put up your house, see if it works. If it doesn't get any mason bees, move the house. Um, usually they look to uh, man-made sturdy objects, not to trees. So look to the side of your house or a fence. Um, if you can provide some uh, cover so they're not getting direct wind and rain. So under your eaves is perfect. Um, and, or if it is on a fence, you can provide, sometimes I've made, um, I've taken a milk jug and I've cut out the top and bottom and I've put the house in there. So that works well. Uh, and if you're still having trouble, contact me or uh, check one of the resources that I added on one of those slides uh, or, uh, you know, go down to Wild Birds Unlimited. They'll help you out as well. 
uh, are there any requirements rules for having honey beehives in North Vancouver? This would be an excellent question for Megaly from Bee Watch, and you can always uh, phone her or contact her on our website. But to my knowledge, you have to register your hive through a government website. But other than that, I do believe anyone is allowed hives. I really want one, but bears are a consideration in my area. But one day, I'm gonna get them, or I'm gonna get them in the story house, which is up here. No, wait, it's right up here on the picture. Uh, so look for that in the future. Wouldn't you love to have library honey? That would be so cool. Um, I would like to have some bee houses. However, I am in a high rise and don't get sun on my balcony until the afternoon. Can I still have bees? So. I do not know absolutely how high a mason bee could fly, but I am going to assume because they're looking for food and they know that food isn't way, way up there. I'm gonna say third level, maybe as high as you can go for a mason bee house. Um, if you are higher than say third or fourth floor, you can maybe look to see if there's a community garden in your area. Often uh, they won't mind if you attach a house to maybe one of their surrounding fences and then you can go visit it or you can when we're open come by and check out our mason bee tree and have a little bee time um and i think oh and one last question do mason or leaf cutters see colors the way we do uh i think i mentioned they like uh whites and blues uh but a lot of the flowers do have um different colors on them that we can't see on the ultraviolet range. So I know um, dandelions often for bees have a dark purple center. Uh, so uh, probably um, more knowledgeable, knowledgeable people on plants and some of the really good nurseries around here could help you um, choose some flowers. Um, I know a lot of them have uh, markers like, um, not Snapdragon, but some of the lupins um, we'll have little dots that help leave um, bees up their kind of tubular shapes. But um, so a master gardener would know better than I. So thank you so much for joining uh, me today for Native Pollinators. I hope I could get you excited about all the amazing bees in your neighborhood and that you can go out and look for them, uh, share them with your family and friends, show your kids. Um, get your community garden and your garden clubs excited. If you have any questions, come ask us at the library. Oh, and one other thing I'd mention, I have some uh, great resources. I have created a Explore Your Topic page on our website, all about mason bees with a whole bunch of resources and several book lists, which I will also attach to this webinar. Thanks again and have a great rest of your day.